Where am I? Really overview? I'm right over here. Now, folks, how do we preach the gospel? It is a very good question. Well, we have to understand how the gospel works, right? And so, if you simply want to know how to share the gospel, I'll tell you right now. Here's how it goes. All right. Do you think there's an afterlife? Let's freeze here, because it's a good question to start off. And here's why. Now, there is a way to um, share the gospel and the full gospel without offense. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me share with you what I do. If I meet a complete stranger, I can bring up the gospel without bringing up the gospel. All I do is ask one question. And this has been absolutely life changing. I've done it for years. I just say, do you think there's an afterlife? Mm -hmm. I did it this morning, went to a local college, spoke to three young people. What's your thoughts on the afterlife? I didn't mention God, Jesus, heaven, hell, the Bible, sin, righteousness, judgment, any of those things that make them and us feel uncomfortable. I just ask for their opinion. And they, most people say, <clears throat> well, I, uh, I, I, I do think there is an afterlife. Say, so heaven and hell? And they say, well, I don't know. I say, afraid of dying? And they say, yeah, I'm terrified. So it's very humble of you to admit that. The Bible says every human being is haunted by the fear of death all their lifetime. It's the book of Hebrews. And that's something you and I can tap into because we're talking to somebody that's not an animal. They're not a primate. They're not a beast. They're a human being. God's placed eternity on their heart and there's something in them that says, oh, I don't want to die. That's their God-given will to live. And so when I ask someone that question, I know that there's something in them that's going to agree with what I'm saying. All right, noted. Let's continue. I don't have any idea. Now, do you think about it much? I do. Are you afraid of death? I, a little bit. A little bit. I We're all so. terrified of it. Yeah. It's like jumping out of a plane at midnight with no parachute. Right. Are you afraid of dying? Absolutely. So what, are. what are you going to do about it? I mean, just live every day as best as you can. So you think it's inevitable? Definitely. So it's like a truck hitting for you. You're standing on the road. It's inevitable. You just stand there and say, I'm going to enjoy myself until I get hit. I mean, basically. You wouldn't do that. You're not You're thinking about <laughs> it at all. <laughs>It's inevitable, but there's something you can do about it. Look, let me give you an analogy just to show the power of faith, okay? Analogies are crucial and very, very useful. Use them especially when you're trying to explain what faith is. If you're going to jump out of a plane without a parachute 10,000 feet, would that be scary? Absolutely. It would be scary. It would be scary for you too. <laughs> oh, yeah. So if I gave you a parachute and you put it on and had faith in the parachute that your mother packed so you know it's going to open, would that change anything? <laughs> it definitely would. I would still be scared. <laughs> yeah, but the amount of fear would be controllable. Yeah. You can say, I trust this parachute. Yeah. You, say, you, say, you say, I'm going to jump now. I'm not going to hit the ground at 120 miles an hour on my face. I'm going to land on my feet at five miles an hour. So the parachute changes everything. Yeah. And your faith in the parachute helps you deal with your fears. So faith is incredibly That's powerful. So oh yeah. A lot of people a lot of people discount faith and they say, Oh yeah, faith in God is just for weak people. Yeah, oh. put a parachute for weak people too. It's bread and butter at this point. So I gave you basically the list of what you have to go through. Link in the description for the original video. Now do you believe in God's existence? I believe in a higher power. For sure. Is the higher power happy with you or angry at you? I think that they're cheering me right on, to be honest. You do? Yeah. And what about you? For me, I definitely think that there is some higher form out there. Is this higher power angry at you or happy with you? I think I think they'd be happy. Okay, well, I'm going I'm I'm to try and do you ladies a favor. It's not going to seem like it, but be patient with me. I'm going to show you you're in mortal danger. That is, you're in danger of something terrible happening to you, but you don't realize it. You can, if I'm able to convince you, you can do you a great favor. Does that make sense? Because you can do something about it. Okay. So you're going to be patient with me? Okay, ask them the question. Are you a good person? People think that they're good people. And they will say, usually, yes. Now, we know that's false, but ask them that question anyway. So then after that, you test them. And you let the Ten Commandments, right, from Exodus 20, to judge them by simply asking questions. You're not, they're judging themselves. You're not saying anything like, oh, you're going to hell or whatever. No, no, no. I am simply saying these questions right here to test out whether or not you are a good person. And so it starts off like this, right? Do you think you're a good person? Yes. You do? I do. How many lies have you told in your life? I have told a few lies. So what do you call somebody who tells lies? Somebody who's made a mistake. Have you lied? I have, yes. So what do you call somebody who tells lies? Same. Uh, definitely somebody who is making a mistake. I'm going to give you a clue. It rhymes with fire and begins with L. A liar. So what are you? A liar. 
And you? Why? It's hard to say about yourself. <laughs> now, have you ever stolen something, even if it's small, in your whole life? I have not. You know, you know what we tend to do? We tend to minimize or trivialize sin. We say, I just stole little things. I tell white lies. Nothing serious. Mm -hmm. But sin is deadly serious to God. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Yes. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Why not? That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> I just wouldn't. I love my mother. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? I wouldn't. Why not? Yeah, because I love her. Yeah, and that would dishonor her horribly yeah. to use her name as a cuss word. And you've taken the name of God, the holy name of God, the one who gave you life, and used it as a cuss word in the place of a four-letter filter word to express disgust, which is called blasphemy, punishable by death in the Old Testament. Ladies, you are being patient with me, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> one to go, and this is a doozy. Tell me your doozy. Jesus said, if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked with lust? Yes. Have you ever what? Looked, looked with lust. Looked with, oh, yes. Have you had sex before marriage? Yes. Yes. So ladies, I'm not judging you. But you both told me that you're lying, blasphemous, fornicating adulterers, uh, and you probably have stolen because you told me you're lying, so I can't really trust what you're saying. Obviously, you're going to say yes to every question. To, to every question, they'll say yes. Um, they'll answer it yes. Because obviously, you can't lie to yourself that you did this. Some might lie, but it's really rare. Okay, They definitely, definitely um, will at least say yes to three out of the four questions, at least. Is you ask them, are they going to heaven or to hell? Some will admit yes, some will say it depends, or some will be like, oh, it's too strict. Don't worry about it. The point is, is that they answer the question, okay? And after all, you're judging based upon what you just told me. You told me that you are a liar, that you are a thief, right? You told me that you committed adultery, that's fornication for some fat matter, okay? And you say God's name is vain, which is blasphemous. These are things that you admit to, all right? You admitted to me. I asked you these questions, and you admitted to me. So here's the big, here's the big if. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you look at four, you're going to be innocent or guilty. I'll definitely be guilty. I'll be guilty of heaven or hell. Um, I think uh, I don't think it's as black and white as that, to be honest, because I think we have a lot of um, there's forgiveness, right? God is about forgiveness. Yes and no. Okay, so we're allowed to make mistakes in our life, right? And we're allowed to also make amends for our mistakes. So how can you make amends for lust and fornication? How can you, how can you balance up the scales? Hey, can I uh, ask you a question? Have you? Done yes, I've broken more commandments than you ladies have, because I'm older. But that's why I'm a Christian. How about it? I'm a Christian. I'll tell you now. If you die in your sins, you've got God's promise, you'll end up in hell. The Bible says all liars are their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no blasphemer, no adulterer, no hero of God's kingdom. So both of you are in mortal danger, you're in terrible danger. If you die in your sins, God gives you justice and exposes all your secret sins. You're in big trouble. You're up the river Niagara without a paddle, which brings us to the gospel. What did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know? He died on the cross. Do you know that? <laughs> now, most people know that, but they don't know this. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on the cross. That's why he said it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. If you're in court and someone pays your fine, a judge can let you go even though you're guilty. You can say, ladies, there's a stack of speeding fines here. This is deadly serious. But someone's paid them. You're free to go. And he can do that which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, he can let you walk. And even though we're guilty, God can let us walk. He can take the death sentence off us and let us live because Jesus paid the fine so we can walk out of the courtroom on the day of judgment. And it means that God can legally do so. Justice can be done and mercy extended all because of that death and resurrection. What you have to do to find everlasting life to get out of the road of that truck is repent and trust in him. So at the moment, both of you are like someone who's on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up. They're going to jump and this is the plan. They're going to flap their arms, try and save themselves. It's not going to work. I'd say that person, no, trust the parachute. So ladies, don't trust your goodness to save you. It's not going to happen on Judgment Day because you're not good. You're like the rest of us. Yeah. Transfer your trust from yourself to the Savior. And the minute you do that, you've got God's promise and you can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie because he's without sin. You've got God's promise. He'll grant you the gift of everlasting life. And he'll give you a personal miracle. Do you know what he'll tell us a personal miracle? Send you to heaven. No. He will transform you on the inside so you love righteousness. So you love that which is right and just and good. And for a sin-loving sinner, that's a miracle. You go, man, I'm a new person on the inside. All things I want to do in life is please the God that gave me life. And you'll shake your head and say, I'm a brand new person. It's called being born again, where God gives you that new heart with new desires. So ladies, is this making sense to you? Absolutely, yeah. Is it making sense to you? 100%. So what are you going to do about it? We're going we're gonna to look further into God. You have to make sure that you instill the fear of the Lord. They need to fear death. Some think that they don't fear death. So yes, it's going to sound like very pressuring, but it makes sense. Bro, you are guilty. I do not want you on the day of judgment going to hell. This is terrible. This is suffering. I don't want anybody to suffer the wrath of God, but unfortunately, people choose that path anyway. And at least I'm going to tell them that there is a solution. There is a path that you can go to heaven, and that's believing in Jesus. But you hope that they think through what you have just stated. All right? All this explanation, all of this, you want to make sure that they think about it at least. Of course, you would like them to think about it, like, right now. because you can pressure them even more by saying simply, well, what, what happens if you die right now? You can die right now, and then after that, uh, boom, day of judgment. You're going to hell because you didn't believe in Jesus, right? So you can put some pressure that you really want to avoid that. And of course, it's like, it doesn't sound, again, you have to, you have to, 
even though it doesn't sound right that I'm putting pressure, I have no choice because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If they don't have the fear of the Lord, how will they, how will they be able to grasp what I just said? It's impossible. You don't fear death. You don't, well, you don't, you think that you don't fear death. You're not worried about the day of judgment. You're just going to go on your day and pass by and think that you're a good person, even though you're a clear sinner. You don't want them to think like that. So you, they have to be instilled with the fear of the Lord so that they can at least start understanding, have a general idea of what the gospel is all about and what the wrath of God is all about. Okay? They need to know this. Okay. Yeah, think about it, but don't think about it for too long because you could die tonight. I could. Walking around you, I could just like drop right there. 150,000 people die every 24 hours. 150,000. So you're going to think seriously about it with that sort of attitude in mind, the sense of urgency? Oh, uh, absolutely. Do you have a Bible at home? I do. Okay, and you have a Bible at home? It's just been an honor to talk to you. I'm going to give you some literature if that's okay. Do you ever get suicidal thoughts? I feel like we all kind of... I've got a little booklet for you. What about you? Yeah. Uh, I'll give you a little booklet? Sure. It's called You're Not Alone and it's, it's just some principles to help you battle those suicidal sort of thoughts. Because they can come back if you lose your dog or your mum and dad or even grandma and grandpa, it can send you into depression and it's really hard to shake it. So I'm going to give you a little booklet. Great to talk to you ladies. Thank you. That is really it for this video. And um, I hope you use this method. I have used this method. Um, it's pretty nice. It's a nice way to... Um, preach the gospel very effectively without um, hurting them so much. Some people, you know, they're sensitive, but it is what it is. Um, it's at least, I would say, the least sensitive method to preach the gospel. All right. So that being said, we're concluding right here. And uh, I hope you all have a good day. Amen.